like to introduce Tyrian Lewis. Did I say it right? Yes. <laughs> of Heyru Urban Farming. Uh, if you're going to be on the farm tour tomorrow, he will be the first site that we visit. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him. And if you have questions in the chat box, go ahead and submit them. All right. Thank you. So how you guys doing? Um, like you said, my name is Tyran Heyru Lewis. Um, I'm the owner and CEO of Heyru Urban Farming. Um, I'm a fifth generational farmer. Uh, I've been doing this since um, 2017 uh, on my own growing. Um, started off growing in buckets in my backyard. Um, then I, you know, then I went on to 10,000 square feet. Then I'm at, I guess I got accumulation of about three acres um, across St. Louis region. Um, what we do, uh, we sell CSAs, which is community supported agriculture, food subscription. Uh, we sell to chefs. Uh, we do outreach at schools as well with our agriculture curriculum. And um, we also sell to City Greens and North Sarah Food Hub in different places across St. Louis. Uh, proud to be here today. Um, I also failed to mention I am on the board of directors for the Missouri Farmers Union. I'm on the Urban County Committee for St. Louis with the FSA. And also I'm part of the Young National Farmers Coalition. So today we're talking about beginning farmers and um, from a, um, doing tomatoes from my, from my from beginner's farmer's perspective, right? So, um, so before I start talking about tomatoes, I like talking about the history of things. Uh, anytime I'm talking about something, I like talking about the history first. So, um, so the history, where did tomatoes come from? So um, right now, um, in today's time, we, uh, we say um, it comes from like the South America region as wild plants. We're talking about the Andes, Bolivia, um, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. Um, also, we have origins traced back all the way to the Aztecs, uh, so that's Mexico, uh, around 700 AD. And the cool fact I like, uh, tomatoes are also um, known as the apple of love and or the apple of the Moors. So we got the Northern Africans um, uh, came over way before Columbus and came over and when they came and migrated, they integrated with the Aztecs and they exchange things and they say that the tomatoes came from there. So that's a little history about tomatoes. And that's some purple, purple Cherokee tomatoes right there sliced up, one of my favorite varieties. All right, nutritional facts. So nutritional facts about tomatoes is a dietary source of antioxidant lycopene, uh, which has been linked to many health benefits, including reduced risk, risk of heart disease, cancer, it's also a great source of vitamin C, potassium, uh, folate, and vitamin K. And it improves your skin and helps fight several diseases. So that's the cool facts first before I get into it. All right, what do you need to know about tomatoes? Um, it's a lot more than what I got on the slide, so I'm, I'm more of a talker. So I will talk, to, talk about it as well. But the first thing I want to say, um, it requires full sun. So um, full sun, that means, um, of course, Full sun, most sun, and also the, I guess the strongest part of the day is between 12 and 2. So if you got a backyard on a farm, you want to know where that sun is at, where it shines um, the brightest between 12 and 2. And, uh, you know, make sure it's not, uh, it's not a shaded area. It's more of a full area the best way you can. Um, uh, it likes loose soil and organic matter. So what I mean by loose soil is, so tomatoes don't really like um, compacted soil. You know, like not clay soil. It like loose soil. Um, so um, if you don't have loose soil, you can make it loose, um, but sometimes take time, but you also have it contained. So for example, when I first started growing tomatoes, I grew them in buckets, right? I had five gallon buckets. Um, I used compost and some, um, and some soil and mix it all together. Organic matter, you could be leaf mulch, uh, it could be uh, horse manure, uh, it could be um, um, also, um, cow manure, whatever, whatever that um, organic matter may be, uh, you can have your build your own compost, uh, uh, leaf clippings, uh, grass clippings, or whatever, and that's a part of your um, organic matter as well. Uh, well, what cool thing about it? Um, so I, I use different different methods when I'm growing um, tomatoes. I know last year when we did um, tomatoes, uh, we had um, not that much weed penetration at all, really. What we did was we put compost all over it first. And then we layered it with leaf mulch, and then we came back with more compost on top. That pretty much lasts most of the season. I was kind of shocked it lasts that long without any, barely pick weeds at all. And um, this year we got um, weed barrier. 
So we use that, um, that black tarp, a weed barrier, and that keeps it moist and everything like that. And um, it keeps it down. So that's what I'm doing this year. So uh, that's a good way to keep it loose, to keep it moist as well. And keep it, also they need support. Humans need support as well, right? So just like tomatoes. Um, so um, I'll talk about that more in the next slide, but um, I done tried steaks, uh, Florida weave, you got tomato cages, you got, you can grow vertically, but it needs support. It needs something to lean on, right? If you don't give it any support, it will be everywhere, right? So um, you, it needs support, right? Keep the space clean. So keep it clean is so tomatoes are susceptible, are susceptible to a lot of diseases. And I'll talk about that later on as well. So you want to keep it clean. What I mean keep it clean is free of debris, weeds. Um, they really funny acting, so they don't like their leaves touching, touching the ground, nothing like that. Um, also, when it rains, a lot of water might uh, splash dirt on the leaves as well. So you make sure you keep keeping that as clean as possible, right? Um, another thing is start small. So funny thing, so the first year I grew, of course, was in buckets. So I thought I knew what I was doing. So the second year I'm growing tomatoes, man, I went gun ho just like I did with okra. I mean, I probably did over 20 tomatoes on by myself, so many tomatoes, and they, they produce a lot. And then, and then, you know, when they get to growing, you got to think about pruning in consideration. You think about diseases, all those different things. And uh, I was kind of overwhelmed. So, uh, so start small, start what you can handle. You can do it in the raised beds, like you say, buckets or whatever, but try to start, start small. And especially if you haven't got any help or anything like that, because when they come, they come. And uh, don't make no mistake like I did, right? Um, so also, uh, when should you plant, all right? So you want to start at least eight weeks before the last frost, right? So, uh, so we're talking about February or March, depending on who you talk to. Um, you want to start them indoors, too. I don't know anybody that starts tomato and direct sow. It might be somebody out there that does that. But uh, the farmers, I know people that grow, not direct sow. So uh, if you don't have a greenhouse or whatever, you could do it in the windowsill. You could do it under some type of light. Um, you could do it on those um, black trays. They got the dome over it. You could start in, start in those as well. But you want to start as a seedling before you transfer, transfer it, um, transplant it outside. Also, um, you want to harden them off. So what I mean by harden them off is, uh, like about two weeks before you want to transplant them outside, you want to put them outside first, right? Put them outside in the day, bring them in at night, all right? And then a week before you want to put them out, then you can leave them out all day. The reason why I said it because it has to get used to the outside elements, right? You got to get used to the wind. Uh, you got to get that stem um, strong. I call it his backbone. You got to get that strong and used to the elements. So you want to um, put it outside first to harden them off and get them ready to, to find a, um, their final home, final destination. Um, seeds, uh, where do you get seeds or transplants from? Um, the seed companies I like to use, uh, one of them is um, Baker's Creek. Baker's Creek is the number one organic seed um, company in the United States, and it's located in Mansfield, Missouri, right here. Um, you also use Johnny Seeds. You could use um, Oregon County, um, Seed Saver, um, they got you, uh, Ujama Seed um, Collective as well, and also Thai Seeds. Thai Seeds is a black-owned seed company. I like using them as well. And then you get transplants from uh, right here locally. Uh, Ritter House is, is a place as well. Ritter House is located in Bridgeton. Um, they have a lot of good transplants there. Uh, uh, a lot of local nurseries as well. Um, Thai's Farm is one of them. But um, I, like, I like using Ritter House. They got good quality transplants. And they look very good, too. Um, so that's the spot that um, I think that um, would be good as well. Also, tomatoes like moisture, right? Now, that's a fine line between moisture and overwatering, right? But it likes to be wet. Um, overwatering, uh, you could kind of um, tell you overwatering, your leaves turning yellow or something like that. Uh, you know, that's, that's overwatering. But, um, you know, as long as they stay moisture. So I like watering either early in the morning or in the evening time. Um, that's the best time for me. Also, um, you don't, they don't like to be wet. They leaves to be wet. So try to, uh, if you water it, direct it at, at the ground or like towards the root area or use drip tape if you got drip tape. But they really, they really don't like their leaves wet like that. So uh, make sure uh, you don't let, let the, weed, the, the leaves get wet. Um, also, um, talk to them, right? Talk to your plants. 
Uh, like you talk to your kids, you talk to people, talk to them. Uh, it really works. Uh, believe it or not, uh, they feel your energy, they feel your spirit, and um, they really um, get to know you as a person as well. So I believe talking to your plants, um, it might sound silly, but it's also a great thing to do, right? I might be a little silly, but talk to your plants, all right? Um, I think I'm good on that one. All right. Tomatoes are susceptible to a number of pests and diseases. So, like I said, they're funny acting and they get a lot of diseases. So as long as you keep them clean, you avoid most of these. But my number one guy is a hornworm right here. So at first, I never knew what a hornworm was. People talk about hornworms. I never saw one for like the first three years I was growing. So after that, I started seeing hornworms. What was crazy was I started seeing poop on my leaves. I thought it was rabbits or something. I'm like, what's the poop kind of big to be a, um, a cow pillar or something like that? So I'm trying to figure it out. So, and they like to camouflage themselves. So when I finally saw one, I was like, man, this is what this thing is. So I took a picture of it because I didn't know what it was. Like, this is a hornworm. And it got his little horns too. I can even tell you what's the front and what the back, to be honest. But it's a hornworm. But if you got chickens, that'll be a cuisine to the, to the chickens though. They love hornworms. So if you got chickens, you give them some hornworms, your chickens will love you for life. But yep, that's your boy right there, hornworm. Um, also, if you see hornworms, sometimes they have like white things, eggs or something on their back. I thought they was having babies, but it's a wasp that lay eggs on them. And when they hatch, it destroys the hornworm. So sometimes when I see that, I just take the hornworm off and just let it go somewhere else. I just kind of want the wasp to do its thing. So, you know, I try to let Mother Nature do it, right? Then you got um, bacteria wilt. Early blight. So I got a picture of early blight. That's right here. So um, basically, like most of these diseases on here is basically from just not keeping it clean. I always going to say that. You got to keep the tomatoes clean. Uh, make sure everything is good with the, with the tomatoes. Uh, mosaic virus. Um, from what I hear, mosaic virus uh, come from, mostly come from like tobacco, right? So if you like someone to smoke tobacco or be around tobacco, you want to make sure you wash your hands. But basically, that's when you deal with any plant, really. You want to keep your hands clean, especially if you're coming from one area to another. We deal with anything, you want to keep your hands clean. So anytime I'm dealing with or trying to go from plant to plant or anything like that, you want to wash your hands. You never know what you might be transferring or transporting to your area. Especially if you got pets at home and you know, and you, oh, you know, you got, you know, they carry stuff that you probably don't even know and it'll affect your plants. So anytime I'm dealing with plants or dealing with animals, anything like that, you kind of want to wash your hands. Right, remember to do that. Um, well, that's all. Oh yeah, rodents. So uh, with rodents, man, everything like tomatoes. Humans like tomatoes too. So you got squirrels, you got deer, you got raccoons, uh, rabbits, whatever it may be. Everything want to get a hold of your tomatoes. Okay, so how do you stop them from getting your tomatoes? So most rodents or squirrels, like squirrels like that, they just want it because they because they're dehydrated, right? So what I'll do is I'll put a bowl of water right next to it, and um, that slows them up, right? Uh, that's what they want. Now, some of them are iron. Now, I can say it's 100% work, but it does work. Uh, they like, man, I still like that flavor, right? So they're going to still try to eat on it. But the water, a bowl of water will cut that down. Also, you could put it in it. You could cage it or put that mesh netting over it because um, the squirrels and stuff can't get that grip on that mesh netting. So you want to net it up and cover it up, especially if you live in a county, anywhere where there's a lot of trees, uh, you will have that problem when I'm getting on your, um, with the rollings getting on there. Um, what else I could think of with that? Uh, I might touch back on that on rollings of other animals, but maybe like I say, I think the mesh netting um, or caging it up or, or the water uh, will help out as well uh, for that, right? Or you do some trap, um, trap um, planting if you want to. And, um, and, and, you know, and just have grow tomatoes that you don't really want to eat for the animals, let them jump on that, and then you have your other plant. All right, so companion planting. So this is what I like to do. I do a lot of companion planting. Um, like I said, I don't use no um, pesticides, anything like that. So I like letting the uh, ecosystem uh, take care of itself, basically, or uh, the environment take care of itself. So my number one, I like to use is dill. So dill is good for a lot of stuff. Um, dill is a companion plant for a lot of different crops. But for tomatoes in particular, it helps trap the hornworms. So the hornworm will jump on the dill and not jump on your tomatoes. And you plant dill right next to it, right? 
or in the same row or to the side or any, however you want to do it, um, that's a good one for that. Garlic. So um, garlic is good for spider mites, right? Keep spider mites away. Um, I never had spider mites on, on tomatoes before, me personally. Uh, but I know people that have. Uh, but garlic is also a good companion for that. Um, sage. Sage is another one. Um, like I said, it repels flea be beetles and attracts beneficial bugs. So when I'm teaching kids, I like, you want to plant stuff to bring in the good bugs, eat the bad bugs. Right? Uh, let them do its thing with that. Uh, marigolds, marigolds are the one, and sage too, rather, but marigolds are a good companion plant for like a many plants is out there. Uh, so that attract bees, and it's also uh, a beneficial bug as well. Um, can someone tell me, uh, does anybody know what pollinates, what type of bee pollinates tomatoes? You know, is, is, it, is, it, a, is it a wasp, is it a bumblebee, is it a honeybee, anybody know that? You know? Bumblebee, ding, 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 yeah, bumblebee, bumblebee pollinates it. Um, also, I like growing um, sunflowers, too, because sunflowers draw in bumblebees and ladybugs, too, uh, so that'll help out. Um, anybody know a tomato, a fruit, or a vegetable? Okay, there we go. All right, I can't trick you out with that. Okay. All right, so calendula. Calendula also stops white flies, um, um, it, and calendula is pretty, too. And uh, you can make solves out of it, a whole bunch of different stuff. But calendula is a good companion plant for tomatoes. Um, basil. I think basil is the best friend of tomatoes in and out the garden. You can cook with it real well. Also, it likes being in the dirt with each other. So basil re re uh, repels um, flies, hornworms, and it improves the taste. I'm going to try that this year, actually. But I heard of you, um, I was looking at, I was talking to some other farmer, like if you put basil in the soil, um, it's in the same section as tomato, it, it was approved that taste. I'm gonna figure that out this year, so we'll see. Um, carrots, carrots is good to aerate the soil. They aerate the soil to a lot of different crops. Um, you know, just give it, make it breathe, and help to help break up that hard compaction too. Um, and um, garlic does that as well, so it helps breaks up that compaction as well. Um, cilantro, I like cilantro. Um, sometimes I put it at the base of my tomatoes, because I grow them vertically, so at the base I grow cilantro for various reasons, but um, it discourages pests um, and it attracts predators. And one of the predators um, that, it that it attracts is a wasp. Um, I forgot the name of that wasp, but that's the wasp it attracts to help take care of those um, hornworms. So um, I love cilantro because it brings in those wasps um, to help me out with that. Um, also, if I do use a spray, um, it'll be organic spray, and some of the sprays I like using is um, BT, is a spray I like to use, and I like using the Pyganic as well. Pyganic you only get at Amazon or um, Hummert's in um, Earth City that I know of. Um, you might see this, um, I forgot that one place off Hanley and Natural Bridge. Uh, they sell stuff too, but I saw Pyganic in there as well. Um, oh yeah. Um, if you are going to spray some type of spray, organic spray, make sure you spray it in the morning or in the evening time. Uh, if you don't want to uh, spray it while it's hot, because um, sometimes it might, uh, especially if you don't um, do the, the concentration right, because uh, it's concentrated, um, if you don't do it right, it will burn out your leaves. So be careful with that. Make sure you read the directions and let you know how to do that. And um, yes, I can think of right now on the companion planting. All right, so what's the difference? You got indeterminate and determinate tomatoes. Um, most people I know grow in, indeterminate because they're the vining type and they produce all summer, right? So you want them to get that, get that good production all summer, um, especially if you want to eat good tomatoes all summer. Now, determinate is the bush type, right? So it's bushy instead of um, lingy. And it doesn't produce all summer, but it give you one good um, low. Some, some, I, I kind of compare it to strawberries. So you got June burn, they give you your, your, your strawberries in June. Then you got ever burn, you get two type of um, um, big um, harvest times of the year. So that's the difference between those two. Um, I only, like I said, I don't even know anyone that I know that even grow determinants um, of that nature. But indeterminate is where to, where to go, I believe, for that. And... All right, 
supporting tomatoes. So, you like I say, tomatoes need support. Um, like I said, I grow vertically. Um, I tried uh, Florida weed. I wasn't successful at all. It probably just me, uh, but I'm not good at uh, at Florida weaving at all. I do know farmers that live by that and do a great job at it. I can't get it right for no reason. So um, yeah, that's that. Uh, cages are good, um, especially if you. It, it can get expensive if you um, dealing with uh, more than ten plants and you're really growing for production. I wouldn't. I wouldn't particularly cage, but um, cages work well. Um, I try steaks too. Uh, to me, when you can do steaks, it's going to eventually lean anyway. Uh, to my opinion, it's going to lean. So uh, I tried rebar, the green steaks you get at Home Depot. I tried all that. Uh, eventually, uh, it does lean on me. Well, like you say, if you can do it, you can do it. But if I do do uh, vertical uh, tomatoes, I did different ways. This year, um, I'm doing it where I just get an um, eight-foot T-post. Uh, I put it in, I get a, a 10, 10 foot conduit. Uh, I use metal conduit, but uh, you do PVC too. And I get my um, my three way, my that T shape uh, P PVC. And I, I make it go through just like that. Um, I use three fourths and I do that and I get my hooks. And I basically, uh, they come with clamps and I clamp it at the bottom of the um, stem. And uh, um, then every time um, I think it needs some more support or get fruit, I either gonna take that clip uh, loosen up some more string, clip it on that, or I just add, start adding clips in general. Um, I think that's the best way that I found to grow um, tomatoes is vertically. Um, I think that's uh, that's more you you can keep it cleaner. Um, you can you can see um, them hornworms and any other pests that's getting on it, and uh, easier to prune that way, and it, it's just easier in general. That was a lifesaver when I started doing the vertical grow. Um, I believe that was um, the best thing I did, was that. Um, does anybody got any questions about how you grow different tomatoes, any way you're growing them, or uh, any questions about um, the, the mulching of it or keeping it clean, anything of that nature? Yeah. We did have a question in the chat about pests. Um, did you have any issues with deer and tomatoes? I have before. Uh, I got a, a deer fence for it now. Uh, one of my locations I got, but um, I have a deer do um, tend to eat eat on the tomatoes though. Um, they got certain. Where was that? Uh, what state it was? Morgan County Seeds maybe. Uh, one of those seeds companies has a, a a mix. It's called deer resistant, and it's a mix with all the seeds. And um, I haven't used. It. I actually got a pack of it. I don't even use it yet. But it's supposed to have different plants that um, that keep away deer. And um, I got a crazy story. I did one time when I went to home, when I first was um, growing, I was in Bell Fountain and um, the deer was eating my stuff. I got some deer resistant stuff that I sprayed on the borderline. It worked, but every time it rained, I had to keep spraying some more. So I came out a lot of money doing that, but uh, it did work. But uh, like I say, when it rained or, or get wet or anything, that'll go away. But deer do eat um, your tomatoes. Uh, you can probably try Cajun it. Yeah. So how, how tall? Uh of a deer fence did you guys go with at the farm? Mm. Uh, was this, uh, I wanna say, was that about eight foot? Yeah, about eight foot. Yeah, about eight foot. Mm. Yeah. I'm just wondering, uh, in your opinion, did the, should I restart it? Yeah, if you don't mind. Okay, so I was just wondering if, does putting up vertically take more setup work than the others, or would you say they're all equal? Um, I think it's equal to Florida weaving, <laughs> to me. <laughs> I think it's equal to that. Uh, it might be a little easier than Florida weaving. Like I say, some people live by it and, and do Florida weaving real well. I just don't. But um, like I always say, I like I don't mind doing a lot of work at the beginning, because during the season, I don't have to do it. So most of my work is at the beginning, at the end. So of course, you're rolling out your weed barrier, putting your vertical up, yeah, that's work at the beginning. But think about it, during the season, you ain't got to worry about picking no weeds. Uh, you ain't got to worry about um, uh, trying to rush. Oh, man, my tomatoes leaning, running out there every day, trying to adjust it and all that stuff. It's just more, it's stress-free. Like, like I say, it is work on the front end, but but in the long haul, it, it'd be better. Yep, in my opinion. All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So uh, what else I got? Oh, yeah, so... The Florida weaving thing, I, I, I'm always stuck on that because 
Man, I done tried like hemp rope. That that gets too weak. Uh, I tried uh, like some type of wiring. That might be too hard or too rough on it. Uh, yeah, I, I just suck, man, yeah, at doing that. So, all right, that's cool with that. Let me see. Oh, go ahead. Mm, I, want, I don't know about easier. I think that's the easiest, one of the easier um, tomatoes that produce, I think. Um, I like cherry tomato because they, they produce, they're heavy yielders. Yeah, so I don't know about uh, uh, easier. I know um, uh, Roma and, um, and cherry are probably the ones that yield the most to me. I know last year when everybody did horrible with tomatoes because of the weather, and uh, the only tomatoes I saw producing was the Romas. They, they they produced heavy last year during that drought we had, and um, it started producing later on in the season. Most of the tomatoes, like around September and stuff, if, if you held on tight, most people probably just gave up on them and um, and just took them all up. But um, yeah, they um, started producing more later on in the year. But answer your question, I think cherry to uh, tomatoes produce more and yield better than um, than some tomatoes. Yeah. Oh, uh, just the drought. Um, the drought we had. Um, it was hard on tomatoes. Like I said, tomatoes like being moist, and um, yeah, so I think that's the heat factor. Yeah, um, and I had water, and I was watering it. It's still, yeah, it's just slow. Yeah, production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that. Um, go back to that. All right. So, any questions? So, basically. Uh, when you're dealing with tomatoes and you're you starting off growing, um, the main thing, when well, I say as a beginner, um, I wouldn't go gun ho with anything. Um, I wouldn't just uh, say, oh, I'm going to grow a whole bunch of seeds. You want to make sure um, it's something you can handle. Um, also, uh, I would make sure um, your, your soil is loose. Uh, make sure it's not compacted. We got a lot of clay soil here in this state, so just make sure it's loose. Add as much compost you can, as much organic matter you can. Uh, um, prune it. When you're pruning it, you want to, um, you got to take care of the suckers. My first year growing, I didn't even prune. I just let it do its thing. And you can do that too. Uh, but, you know, you prune it, you get more of a yield and better production out of it. And, um, yeah, uh, and I think growing in buckets is, um, is easy. Uh, for, it's easier for tomatoes because it's something you can focus on. It's controlled. Um, and it's um, easier for you to uh, maintain. So I, if I was starting off at the beginner, I'd start in buckets or in a raised bed or something of that nature. Uh, so it'd be easier for you. Yep. And um, yeah, any other questions or anything? Yeah, uh, as a beginning farmer, uh, what were your like top five tools? You know, the first tools that you got, like the most important <laughs> things you'd suggest somebody who's kind of going from uh, backyard gardening to maybe wanting to sell some stuff. Okay, so um, the, the five, top five tools would be a, um, a planter, um, a tiller, uh, a, a garden rake, uh, a hat <laughs> for the sun, and uh, yeah, what else I can think? A planter, a rake, tiller. That's a good question. Um, those are the. I think that's the main and the shovel. Yeah, and the shovel. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, you said to start small uh, for somebody who maybe, you know, they got a full time job, but maybe they want to start selling at market. Like from your experiences, what would be kind of a good size to maybe that first year kind of chew hmm. off? Ooh, OK. So you say, OK, it's all about your time. They say they, they work right. The full time worker. Um, I wouldn't go more than 10 plants, to be honest with you, uh, especially if you're working and you can't really focus on it. I, I say 10, no more than 10 plants, whatever that may look like to you. Uh, but yeah, 10 plants. And, um, and I grow some tomatoes that I like to eat myself because uh, you'll be, um, you'll take, you know, if you're doing something that you like to eat or whatever, I think you'll put more love into it and respect it more. Yeah. A couple other more questions in the chat here. Um, how easy was it to connect with buyers? How did you start kind of making those relationships? Um, and then why did you decide to go with the CSA? Okay. Um, start making relationships and the buyer. So first you got to know your community. So if I'm going to my community and I have a community garden, you got to know you, you got to know them. So anybody knowing them, you got to be in tune with them. 
So I just went out and started meeting them, you know. I started going to the house or giving them flyers. Started like, it's funny because before I started growing food, no one talked to me in the community I was in. I didn't grow up over there. I was over there for five years prior. Um, no one said nothing to me. So when I started doing that, first of all, if you build it, then if you build it, they will come, basically. Like when I started doing work, people started asking, like, what you doing over here? Like, what you got going on? And I, I actually made myself vulnerable and open to them. So I went out there talking to them and, man, just little stuff, man. Like elderly um, ladies that live on my street, you know, I probably take their trash out. Just little simple stuff that I'm, I'm going to do anyway as it's just being a human, right? Uh, speaking to them, may need some help with this, or somebody got a bad day, you sit there and talk to them for a while, just being uh, personable, really. And uh, people that's been from you, uh, do, do business with you if they like you, right? They don't like you, anybody goes to spend no money with you, do nothing to you, so you gotta be liked. Um, that's something you probably wanna do anyway, right? Um, be all human here, just um, be yourself, really. And um, CSAs, when you start doing that, was COVID. To be honest, um, I wasn't even thinking about a CSA. And then when, when, uh, when COVID happened, the people started getting more health conscious and started asking questions more and want to be more involved more. And then uh, it was a thing where, you know, when I felt like doing CSA, it's like, okay, I got a pickup spot. People had a cooler on their porch, the non-contact, right? Easy, I drop it off, put it in the cooler and go by my way. Um, that's kind of how I got involved with that. And also every five I sell, I donate to a family in need too. So. Uh, so that was kind of um, inspiring for other people that want to buy it from him. Okay, he gonna give it to a family in need if I buy it from him. So that's kind of how I kind of got started with that. Yep. Cool. Um, and so do, do you do farmer's market or have you done farmer's market? Um, yes, I do. Uh, so I be at B. Wells Farmer's Market. She has a different um, different thing that they, they doing this year. So they sell it on Wednesdays now. Um, it was on Saturdays. So I guess they're going to purchase from farmers, then she'll sell, sell they themselves. And that's on, um, oh, man, it's going to kill me if I don't know the address. 2027 Salisbury, I, I believe. Yeah, 2020, 2027 Salisbury, yeah. Yep. And uh, in terms of the CSA, did you have to do advertising, or was that like just the network that you had built up with your customers and kind of word of mouth kind of thing? Um, it started off as word of mouth. Um, I do advertising like on Instagram, like social media, stuff like that. I think Instagram is the best one for me and my niche, but um, yeah, it was mostly word of mouth, but I did do um, social media advertising though. Yep. Um, that looks like all the questions in the chat. Are there any more questions in the audience? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, cool. Thanks, Tyreen. Let's give Tyreen a round of applause. I do, I do, well, I'm sorry. I'm cutting no, off. go I'm for it. You got so time. I, yeah, I want to say uh, my best, my favorite varieties. Just throw that out there. So my favorite varieties is purple Cherokee. Um, I love that uh, tomato. Uh, uh, black cherry is another one. Uh, mortgage, mortgage lifters. Um, beef steak. Um, pineapple um, tomatoes. Uh, that's pretty cool. And... Uh, and um, Missouri Pink Lady, they're my favorite ones. Um, I love different variety of cherry tomatoes too, but I think black cherry tastes the best. Uh, you just pop them in your mouth. And um, I think that's all I want to say. Huh? Oh, green tomatoes. So, well, well, my well, my business structure kind of different. Most of my tomatoes is green tomatoes because most of my customers like green tomatoes. So I never really see them prosper to their color, right? So, uh, so as soon as they get green, like I got, I got for some reason I got a niche for green tomatoes. Like a lot of my cousins want green tomatoes. So that's fried green tomatoes. So, um, so when I when I can make an order of some colored tomatoes, I like that, so I can watch and see it. But I, I mainly always got green tomatoes, unless they're the cherry ones, of course. But other than that, yeah, it's something about fried green tomatoes, I guess, uh, that people like. So, um, yeah, got anything else? Okay. Okay, go ahead. What do you like particularly about purple I've never heard of that variety. Um, yeah, so I like how they look, I like how they taste. It's funny because the first tomato, uh, and, and it's also an um, um, indigenous um, people um, um, grow purple Cherokees too, right? So I like, I like the taste of them. That's the first one I actually taste when I first started growing tomatoes. So I, was, I guess I'm a type of um, bias, I guess. So that's the first one I ever grew and I taste. And I'm like, man, tomato tastes like this. Uh, it's totally different from a store or anything. So 
I don't know. I just like the color too. When you cut them open, you got the red and the purple kind of mixed in. And um, so, yeah, so it might be like a, a bias thing. That's my first time growing up. But they are, they do taste good though. Are you the only person have to get purple I don't know if I'm the only person, but you can get stuff from me though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't think you can see them in the store, but uh, I'm probably not the only one. I th I'm pretty sure there's other farmers that grow it. But, uh, but yeah, you can definitely get them from me though. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Tyreen. Let's give Tyreen a round of applause. All right. Thank you.